Hello, my name is Dr. Gerard Toll, and this is the lecture in the module on climate and conflict in my course, Global Conflicts, which I am teaching at Virginia Tech School of Public and International Affairs. In this lecture, what I want to do is review briefly some of the uh, current controversies uh, surrounding uh, the relationship between climate and conflict. I have boiled this down in a very uh, parsimonious way with this particular question, does climate cause conflict? Um, of course, we often frame that question today as does climate change cause conflict? But it's worth uh, bearing in mind that this question is actually an old one. Uh, and that climate um, past and climate present is something that we need to uh, think about as an ongoing source of intellectual um, uh, discussion uh, and debate uh, amongst uh, intellectuals over its relationship to human character and to conflict. Now, of course, uh, to uh, make it much more um, nuanced, uh, we could talk about conflict being structural or direct. Um, it often is said today, does armed, uh, does climate change cause armed conflict? So there's a sense that uh, we're dealing with direct violence, we're dealing with kinetic violence as opposed to the slow violence or the structural violence uh, of environmental degradation and the um, changes in the environment wrought by uh, anthropogenic um, change and wrought by uh, the particular form of uh, global capitalism that we have. Uh, we could also talk about whether a conflict is individual or group uh, interest state and interstate. Well, of course, in this course, we're really looking at the latter form. Um, and the, um, the way in which one can think about this particular question is uh, what I want to, to examine in this lecture. Uh, I begin with the quotation from David Wallace Wells' book, which I have assigned, which, uh, which is Heat phrase everything. Now, um, I have, um, as a requirement for this particular module, I have had you read uh, some of the books that are coming out now on um, what climate change means, what some of the scenarios are, uh, the less than two degrees, more than two degrees, and up to f uh, beyond four degrees scenarios. But what we're dealing here is a condition of anthropogenic climate change. It is where we are, according to some, in a new era where humans are a geological force, um, where um, the climate of the planet uh, has been... Um, changing as a result of the alteration of our atmosphere by humans in this uh, massive planetary climate experiment uh, of the production of uh, greenhouse gases. Uh, and what we're discovering is that um, uh, the atmosphere, our climate, what we've taken for granted for thousands and thousands of years uh, is actually quite delicate, is actually quite frail uh, and vulnerable. And we are now in a new condition um, where um, human beings, homo sapiens across the planet, are living with a, a climatic conditions which have not previously existed uh, under the uh, reign and indeed the domination of Homo sapiens. So this is a new era and some have described this as the Anthropocene uh, where humans are a geological force. Now the intermingling of physical uh, and human uh, physical um, environmental conditions uh, and human societies has been part of the human experience uh, from the from the get go, uh, as um, Homo sapiens developed the capacity to 
um, manipulate symbols and develop the ca capacity for language. Um, they began telling stories and the, the stories uh, that they told created a sort of climate cultures. Um, and so that is something that we need to be aware of uh, when we look at the current moment. This is a very old problematic that we're dealing with, but obviously it has now come to the fore because of the particular emergency condition, because we can see the end of the uh, reign of Homo sapiens on planet Earth as a consequence of uh, some of the scenarios that are being uh, discussed uh, with climate change. Now, in the past, the discussion about climate uh, and human society has been the opposite, rather than uh, the opposite to what we're discussing right now, where um, we, are, we have the sense that the weather is a product of our invention. In the past, it was a question of how the weather and climate changed humans. Uh, and um, there's a series of discussions from the Greeks onwards about how physical environment, uh, mountains, uh, oceans, uh, plains, uh, and the particular climatic conditions that go along with that shaped uh, human society, shaped uh, the personalities of, of people. Um, this was powerfully articulated by the French uh, Enlightenment philosopher uh, Baron de Montesquieu uh, in the 18th century in his book The Spirit of the Laws, uh, which was published first in 1748, I believe, um, where he wrote that the empire of the climate is the first and the most powerful of all empires. And he went on in that book to talk about how people are more vigorous in cold climates, how people are weaker and lazier in a more temperate uh, climates, how you have a particular condition which is uh, um, shaped uh, and assertive. He went on to actually argue that the laws and the polities created uh, by human beings were uh, dramatically shaped by their uh, human geography, uh, such that you had maritime empires, uh, maritime republics, um, as having a certain characteristic, trading characteristics, because of uh, the physical geographic endowments. And this actually shaped the thinking of the um, the founding fathers of the United States, among many other people. So there is this long tradition of thinking about climate and the physical environment as being a determining force on in human society. Uh, we go to the 19th century and we encounter a book like Ellsworth Huntington, a professor of geography at Yale University. Uh, he wrote a book called Civilization and Climate in 1915. He wrote lots of others and uh, as well. And he argues uh, about the determinant force uh, of the uh, environment on uh, human society. Um, this uh, we can see this up through the 1940s. So uh, as the French uh, thinker uh, Guru uh, uh, in his book Le Pays et Tropico, which is about uh, tropicality and tropical countries, and he essentially made uh, an updated. A version of an old argument, which is that the tropics were places of physical danger and indeed moral danger for for Europeans. This was very much uh, connected to uh, a European imperial attitude towards the rest of the world. These were places of disease, malaria, uh, and also exoticism, including exotic females uh, and the like. And so uh, there's dangers to uh, the kind of the upright European uh, when uh, he, and it usually is a he, goes into this particular Particular, these particular climates and uh, there are all sorts of dangers associated with with going into these areas so that a uh, um, notion uh, was one that was very very prevalent in 
uh, and is still to a certain extent in our culture. We have today a contemporary versions of it, the book Prisoners of Geography and, and Robert Kaplan's book The Revenge of Geography. Um, but so in the past, the discussion was that environments shape personality, moral character and civilization. And of course, this became a rationale for uh, European colonialism and for civilizational superiority uh, and ideas of hierarchy of civilization because the Anglo-Saxons looked around the world and found themselves to be the most moral, upright and virtuous uh, and uh, of peoples who were engaged in uh, trade and produced doctrines like liberalism which were good for everyone uh, and of course as you can see this was the sort of a rationale for what was a rather rapacious uh, form of capitalism and imperialism that was established that created the global economy or the world economy uh, from the 15th century onwards so you know with that with the idea of imperialism Imperial expansion came these particular doctrines uh, and the whole history of liberalism is, is very much caught up with that but the larger point is that this is sort of a, a deep existential uh, stuff this is what uh, homo sapiens have been thinking about for thousands of years because they are encountering and dealing with the weather and uh, the weather in ex its extremes produces um, this particular uh, understanding of um, um, of the uh, ways in which it, it can be dangerous and the ways in which uh, it requires all of these uh, sort of responses, rational and also emotional in the parts of, of human beings. Now, a nice discussion of that whole history uh, are the lectures by the um, Queen's University um, Belfast um, geographer David Livingston in his um, Radio 4 lectures, uh, The Empire of Climate. Uh, I would uh, strongly recommend uh, that you listen to these. These are very, very short. They're only about 15 minutes, uh, but they're really wonderful and give you some sense of that larger history. Um, now, um, let's talk about the uh, environmental discourse then in, um, in more recent years. Well, I have identified here three books which can be summarized, sort of summarized decades. Uh, the 1972 book, The Limits to Growth, um, which was an attempt to try to model um, the implications of uh, population growth uh, on human resources and produced some dire uh, visions of uh, human resources being um, eventually uh, uh, no longer um, being available and this leading to a kind of scenarios uh, of collapse. Uh, and so that was a book which was uh, considered quite alarmist at the time and lots of people pushed back against it. But in hindsight, uh, it has been proven to be quite prophetic in terms of its uh, um, placement of the whole problematic of um, a resource use and resource depletion uh, before our society. In the 1980s, uh, the book that I would point to is a, a UN report uh, produced by a former a Norwegian Prime Minister, uh, Brutland. Uh, it was published in 1987 and it uh, first articulated the idea of sustainable development and the imperative of sustainable development. Now, it, uh, in one sense, um, was a response to the limits of growth but it was a call to action to try to have forms of development which were sustainable. Now, many would argue that the idea of sustainable development, uh, given the particular nature of the development, this sort of extractive, exploitative capitalism that we have across the globe, uh, is uh, one that is inimical to sustainability, that the very uh, profit imperative is one that uh, leads corporations to go to the ends of the earth to extract resources without much concern for the long-term implications of that. 
uh, in the 1990s. Uh, Al Gore's book, uh, which was published in 1992 before he became vice president, Earth and the Balance, really began to sound the alarm about uh, what was then described as global warming. Um, uh, but uh, Gore uh, was a kind of a key figure here uh, in signaling to uh, the United States and to the world that uh, the um, the production of uh, greenhouse gases was going to produce major planetary changes. Uh, and of course, he later uh, uh, narrated and starred in a documentary called An Inconvenient Truth, uh, which was much criticized at the time, but again has proved extremely uh, prophetic. Now, um, what does all this mean in terms of thinking about conflict? Well, there's a large history, as you might expect, of thinking about conflict um, and a uh, climate and the environment, some of it quite uh, characterized by these sort of environmental racist assumptions and uh, ethnocentric European uh, assumptions that justified uh, colonialism, and indeed slavery in the past. Well, um, in the 19, uh, 1990s, uh, environmental scarcity was one of the key concepts and uh, Homer Dixon's book, uh, which was published in 1999, uh, outlines a particular model of how the uh, population growth, unequal resource access, and uh, decrease in the quality and quantity of renewable resources would lead to this condition of uh, increased environmental secur- uh, scarcity. And then the impacts that would have in various societies would be migrations, expulsions, increasing stress, uh, decreased economic productivity, and then this would uh, spiral uh, to weaken states, reduce their capacity, and that would lead to, and this was a, a, f- a term which was very much in vogue in the 1990s, uh, the idea of failed states. Um, uh, later, we now call them fragile states. Um, but that particular model was one that uh, was uh, much discussed in the 1990s. And um, uh, Robert Kaplan, in his book, uh, The Coming Anarchy, actually initially an article, uh, sort of captured the zeitgeist of that uh, sensibility, uh, even though his own uh, particular version of it was in no way scholarly. Um, now... The 2000s and the years since the publication of Al Gore's book have really seen a massive change it's, uh, in how we think about these things. It's Now it is about climate change. Now it is about anthropogenic uh, climate um, change as the real central problem. Uh, and so the book... Michael Clark's book, uh, All Hell Breaking uh, Loose on the Pentagon's Perspective, um, articulates contemporary thinking on it in the U.S. military. And that is that there's increasing awareness of the fact that uh, with um, 1.5 and 2 degrees and just above 2 degrees, we're going to get a significant reduction in the world's uh, ice caps. And that's going to lead to uh, massive increases uh, uh, in the world's oceans. And it's already happening and it's happening much quicker than we uh, understand. Indeed, uh, David Wallace Wells' book, one of the virtues of it is underscoring how the speed, the scope and the scale of the um, challenge of climate change is much greater than we uh, understand. And the very beginning of this book really articulates that in a very uh, stark and helpful manner. But oceans rising is only one aspect of it. The temperature is rising globally, and that's empirically undeniable now uh, across the planet. The, the planet's temperature is, is at an all-time, uh, all-time high in terms of uh, uh, the uh, recorded history in human civilization. And then there's a massive species extinctions going on. The uh, sixth extinction, uh, according to Elizabeth Colbert in her book of that uh, title. 
What does this mean in terms of uh, what we're looking at? Well, the term threat multiplier is one that is used by the military to understand climate change. They see climate change not as their particular enemy because they conceptualize enemies as uh, other states, uh, as uh, other great powers or as, as terrorist groups. So it is rather a, a danger and they see it as... Um, a sort of mediating and blocking and complicating the their particular rationale or their particular uh, mission uh, above all else, which is to defend uh, the homeland of the United States. Uh, and so with the very conditions of the planet changing, this creates all sorts of uh, complications. Um, there are new arenas of great power competition opened up by the uh, melting of the Arctic ice, for example. There's effectively a new ocean there. Uh, but the scenarios really are less about uh, these arenas of competition and more about uh, scarcity, the real serious impact of drought, food scarcities as uh, particular food chains begin to collapse and as uh, temperature rising impacts the uh, productivity of uh, wheat crops and the fact that they can't be grown in certain areas and then uh, what is grown is increasing the, the yields are, are, are significantly stressed and uh, reduced and diminished. Um, and then there's also governance stresses with uh, climate refugees, people fleeing from uh, low-lying island states, and then also areas that have been stricken by drought. Uh, you're inevitably going to have the collapse of fragile states, uh, and you're going to have significant instability in uh, certain strategic states. And this is already happening, of course, in Saudi Arabia and other uh, countries, Iran uh, and elsewhere, which uh, have significant resources of oil um, and are really quite badly hit by um, the uh, the rise in temperature uh, and the uh, and the drought conditions that come along with that, and then that's to say nothing of the very kinetic uh, forces because if that if those uh, sort of elements are have a, have a slow violence, there's also the very dramatic violence of, of storms, of catastrophic events, uh, of super hurricanes uh, and of pandemics, which is, of course, something that we're in right now, um, and the overwhelmed capacity of uh, states and healthcare systems uh, and first responders to, to uh, deal with all of these. Now, one of the scenarios that is discussed is the uh, synchronous failures, that all of, all of these happen at the same time, or there are sort of cascades in which they then create this uh, mega uh, failure in, in which all of these things come together. And that's the scenario of all hell breaking loose that is discussed by Clar. Now, I'm... Um, he discusses also uh, a new version of Herman Kahn's um, famous uh, and very, very dark uh, escalation ladder. And uh, Herman Kahn's, uh, who was a defense intellectual for the 1950s, he developed a 44-step uh, escalation ladder, which ended with general nuclear war and began with, uh, you know, initial skirmishes between states. Um, so that was how uh, conflicts could ratchet up until it be, would lead to a catastrophe. Well, uh, Clark's book is sort of organized around this. He's not, if you read it quite closely, what he articulates as the new ladder of escalation and how he organizes the book is somewhat different. Um, but you have here uh, five different steps, the humanitarian disasters and relief operations, where the United States military is essentially uh, addressing problems that are a consequence of um, simple uh, humanitarian relief. So Asian typhoons uh, and the like, helping out in Indonesia, helping out in the, in the Philippines, but not necessarily 
with any kind of strong strategic rationale. And then there's the next uh, level up where you're responding to fragile state collapse. And even though the fragile state may not be strategic, it may not have oil, it may not be central to the United States, but by virtue of its location and by virtue of the fact that there are climate refugees and then leaving that area, it will impact strategic states or states the United States believes it has a, you know, a major stake in its stability of these, these states. So Turkey, which is a NATO ally of the United States and uh, understandings of vital neighborhoods and what neighborhoods are particularly vital for the United States. Now, of course, we are in a moment where there is a sort of strategic rethinking of what is vital and what is not vital in terms of uh, U.S. interests in the world, uh, because a place like Afghanistan, which is not a uh, strategically vital, nevertheless, was the source of uh, massive expenditure of, um, of blood and treasure on the part uh, of the US. So there's a sort of reaction to that, uh, understandable one. Third level up is multi-country deployments uh, in rapid response to global shock waves of various types. And that's these sort of cascades, cascading events that are interdigitating. And uh, so how drought impact, uh, it goes together with catastrophic storms, goes together with a pandemic disease. Uh, and goes together with governance failures and uh, capacity failures and then uh, the particular uh, dark scenarios that are created as a consequence of that. The, uh, the next level up is great power clashes and uh, confrontations over uh, limited resources uh, and of new particular uh, uh, fields of competition opening up. And then the last is catastrophic emergencies within the United States. Um, uh, storms, climate, uh, and uh, pandemics uh, of various types, uh, and dealing with uh, climate refugees and the like. So all of those are the things that uh, he discusses in that book and uh, provides a good analysis of it. You can also find, uh, from a U.S. military point of view, um, a discussion of that uh, 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 if you look at the Center for Climate and Security, uh, which has produced a, a report that has just come out on um, a security threat assessment of global, cha um, of global climate change. Um, and so that is one of the things that is uh, uh, worth a uh, looking at uh, those of you who are kind of want to follow up on that. Uh, so climateandsecurity.org is where you can get information on that. Um, now let's talk a little bit about the um, case that uh, is seen as paradigmatic in the debates on uh, climate and conflict right now, and that is the Syrian civil war and the arguments that are made by a, a number of uh, popular intellectuals uh, and others about the, uh, whether this is a climate uh, conflict or not. So you have a, a version articulated by Thomas Friedman uh, that this was a, a revolution which was fueled in some way by climate change. Uh, and so I would urge you to listen to this particular um, video that is produced where he uh, makes the argument. So, uh, so that's one uh, particular perspective, um, but there is a pushback uh, against that by uh, academics. And so I have also assigned um, John Selby et al., uh, their particular uh, essay on climate change and the Syrian civil war, where they make arguments against this uh, rather uh, problematic um, uh, um, identification of um, drought as the driver of the uh, Syrian civil war. There was also drought in Lebanon, and yet you didn't have the same stress uh, there. You didn't have civil war in that particular area. Uh, and then I have uh, assigned uh, an essay, which is from Nature, um, Climate as a Risk Factor for Armed Conflict. And this is an analysis uh, of 
um, the judgments of uh, particular experts uh, on climate uh, and uh, conflict. And they, this particular piece makes the argument that uh, there's still a lot of uncertainty as to what are the drivers of armed conflict um, and of civil wars. Um, and so it outlines the different factors that uh, these experts uh, identify as really the key drivers uh, of armed conflict. Uh, and then it uh, rates their, the degree to which experts are certain or uncertain about them. Um, and um, here is what I want to draw your attention to, is the climate variability and our change, the most influential, not currently seen as such, the most uncertain, mo uh, by, a, by far the largest, uh, the most uncertain uh, variable as far as uh, conflict researchers are concerned. So that is a significant uh, finding and it is the state of the uh, art in terms of thinking about these, uh, this question of um, uh, climate change and uh, conflict, uh, armed conflict, uh, intrastate war, uh, so-called civil war, and then uh, interstate war. Now, um, I'm not really going to touch too much in this course on um, more individualized versions of this. How does climate, uh, uh, particularly hot weather, impact uh, urban crime? But there is considerable evidence to show that uh, violent crime does rise with uh, levels of heat. And here I just uh, want to give a shout out to a really fantastic film, uh, which in part has as its protagonist heat, um, which is a Spike Lee's uh, film from quite a number of years ago called Do the Right Thing. Um, and then I, I want to end uh, with... Um, uh, Jeff Mann and Joel Wainwright's um, vision of four potential social formations that can be produced or that are possible in a condition where uh, climate change is the dominant uh, and the overwhelming issue uh, facing um, human societies and facing the planet. Uh, and they outline these four potential social formations, the climate Leviathan, the climate the Behemoth, uh, and then the climate Mao, and then climate X, uh, which is what they are uh, interested in. Um, the psychological dimensions of um, reading all of this material uh, is something that uh, we have to, to end with. Um, we are we have to negotiate a whole series of cognitive biases when we think about uh, climate change. And David Wallace Wells really gives us a very nice discussion of these um, when he uh, in the chapter climate uh, or crisis capitalism he talks about the significance of um, anchoring bias, the ambiguity effect anthropocentric thinking, automation bias, then the bystander effect, confirmation bias, default effect, uh, endowment effects, illusions of control, overconfident uh, confidence and optimism bias, and then the pessimism bias. Now, all, there's a whole slew of those, but they are all relevant and you need to be aware of those when we are thinking about um, uh, climate change uh, and the uh, future. Um, uh, we're also dealing with the condition of uh, increasing uh, despair about this. Um, I think human beings are sort of prisoners of hope in this case, and the younger generation are obviously leading the way with climate strikes and the like uh, against this uh, terrible condition that we've got ourselves into. Um, but it is one that uh, is going to require considerable empathy for the fact that um, if we work through those cognitive biases, we have to come to a particular awareness that 
the conditions are quite dire and the outlook is quite dire. Uh, what we have done with, uh, in the Great Acceleration, in the Anthropocene, uh, is something which is not going to be undone in any way uh, in an easy manner. Uh, and we, are, we have left our kids and their kids a very, very severe challenge. Uh, of a world which is completely altered and um, we have to kind of face that in a, a realistic way with an understanding uh, of the science front and center uh, as we proceed to uh, address this this massive challenge okay let me leave it there thank you